All right, good evening. We're going to start discipleship class number 10. Okay, this is one of the most important doctrines. This is one of the most important doctrines in basic doctrine. It's called the balance and attributes of God. The balance and attributes of God. So I made you listen to four parts in the balance and attributes of God. So what I'm going to do in this class is go through the whole thing. The whole thing. Okay, so this one is probably the longest teaching that I gave in basic doctrines. Because our God, if you have a greater understanding of this about God, it will be very helpful in everyday life and even deep doctrines that you study in the future. If you know the nature of the personality and the actions and the thinking of God. All right, now, what's really important is the introduction. Okay, so the first thing we'll cover is the introduction. In the introduction, I gave you verses that God has to be balanced. Proverbs 16, verse 11, and chapter 11, verse 1. It is essentially important to know two things. God has to be balanced. So... When he has positive attributes like grace and love, he also has to have negative attributes. Because if he doesn't, the Bible says it's an abomination. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord. So a battery, why does a battery run in full power? Because it has negative and positive energy. See? So God, it makes sense. As a powerful being, he also has positive and negative attributes. To make him all love, 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 then you make him uh, an imbalanced God. And God cannot exist as a result. Another thing to know about God is that he is perfect. So God's attributes are perfect. That is extremely important to understand. It's not 90% perfect. It's 100% perfect. So, for example, if God were to damn somebody to hell forever, people might say, well, that's cruel and mean. He should be like 50-50. No, if you do that, then he's not 100%. See, he, his attribute has to be 100% perfect. What's the purest wrath that you can think of? 100%. Burning in hell forever. See, that's 100%. To give him a leeway and get him out, that's not 100%. See, Same thing with his love when he died on the cross. It's not going to be half-half. It's going to be 100%. So if you know these two parts through the rest of the teaching of the balance and attributes of God, everything else is going to click and make sense. Now, as I've told our online viewers, watching this is going to be too much, too deep, and too fast of verses, and you're going to miss out. That's why I kept recommending to listen to the audio clips. So make sure you keep up with your homework assignments before you watch this video. Okay, so now let's understand another thing about this. His ways are not understood by men. That's another thing to understand about God. Okay, men cannot understand it. And I gave verses on that one. So I mentioned Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, Romans chapter 11, verse 34. But here's one thing, is that God, God himself, understands man. So men cannot understand God, but God understands men. So here's the thing, who are you to question God on how he does things? See that? So when you keep that in mind, about when unfair situations happen in life and you question the ways of God. When atheists have strong arguments to say that why is God a God full of love if this, this, and this happens? Well, you gotta understand this, is that God understands human nature very well, but you don't. So when you understand that, then everything else can fall into play with all kinds of arguments against atheism and when you have doubts and questions in your Christian life. Okay, so now let's talk about the attribute of hatred. Wait, are you serious, Pastor? Yes, God has hatred. Don't you hate things? God has hatred. 
And the verses are very powerful that God has hatred. Malachi chapter 1 verse 3, Hosea 9 15, Psalms chapter 5 verse 5 through 6, Psalms chapter 11 verse 5. Not when you realize that God has an attribute of hatred, it makes sense why he doesn't hesitate to damn a person in hell for all eternity. How can a God be a God full of love? Simple. He's not love in that sense. He is hate, full of hatred. You might say, well, that's not true. Well, look up the verses. The verses says that God actually hates sinners, not just sins, but even the people themselves. Because the reason why is that sin, when a person commits sin, sin becomes a part of that person. Which is why it makes sense God can damn that person to hell. You know why? Sin is on him. See that? So, oh, God loves a person, but he hates the sin. No, he hates the sinner and the sin. Then it's going to click and make sense with a lot of things. Why God would do these things with certain sinners as he punishes them. See? Because he's not a God full of love. He's a God full of hate in those cases. Well, what about verses about God shedding love? So I mentioned one verse as an example, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The answer is very simple in that case. It doesn't say that God currently loves sinners. It actually shows that God's love is at Calvary and he offers it to sinners. So if sinners would receive his love, because right now they have God's hatred on them. So if they would receive his love, then that love would eliminate the hate, and God cannot hate them to send them to hell forever. You see that? Notice all these verses are past tense. For God so loved the world. See that? The only time he ever shed his love on the world was at the cross. Outside of the cross, you got to understand, is God's hatred and wrath. You know why? Because at Calvary, at the cross, God's hatred and wrath is only on his son, Jesus Christ, not upon the world. That's why all this is going to make sense. Now, if God's a God full of hate, shouldn't he be a God full of love? Absolutely. So he has an attribute full of love. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. John chapter 17, verse 26. Matthew chapter 5, verse 46. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 through 39. So in those verses, I gave extremely great examples about God being a God full of love. I mean, Jesus said at one passage, John 17, 26, the love you shed on me, Father, put it on them. Now, isn't that a big blessing? God loves you as much as he loves his son, or even more you don't understand. Because Jesus took your wrath upon himself. So God would spend most of his love on pawn his saved saints, if you're willing to receive it. In one of the other verses, love is so great that the Bible even mentions about loving your enemies. See that? So God can shed his love upon his enemies so much that he would put it at Calvary. See? But outside of Calvary, you got to be careful. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 through 39, which I gave before, his love is so great that nothing, not all of hell, past, present, future, your sins, angels, principalities, powers, can separate you from the love of God. That's how deep and powerful the love of God is. See, don't these two cases so far show what? 100% hatred and 100% love. No greater love, no greater hatred. And that's balance. See, he has hate and love. You put more love than hate, then you make an imbalanced God. All right, um, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4 is his attribute of just and justice. He is a just God justice so he is fair that's the thing he is very fair he pronounces judgment at a fair manner he's going to be honest sincere so Deuteronomy 32 verse 4 Genesis 18 verse 25 Psalms chapter 19 verse 9 Isaiah chapter 45 verse 21 so we'll see right here that God is a God full of justness, justice. So he has to have a judgment of hell, you got to understand. Why is that? 
because of, there are three verses about his judgment of hell, and that shows him being a just God. Matthew 16, verse 27. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. And Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 through 15. Now, if you look at those two verses, it's really interesting what it shows. A lot of people will deny eternal punishment in hell. That is very unfair. But here's the thing. If you look at those three verses that I gave, his forgiveness is eternal as well with his eternal punishment. Now, if you have eternal forgiveness and you have temporary punishment, uh-oh, look at the scales. That's unbalanced. See? Imbalanced. That Then you make a perverted God, not a just God. You see that? In Judges, what do they have to do in court? They have to make sure that whatever benefit or justice they serve, that it has to be at a balanced scale. But what people want is to make God a perverted judge, an imbalanced judge, where he makes the scales tip in their favor for criminals, for crimes and for sins. But for benefits, ooh, give me more, give me more. Then justice is not served properly. You serve an unjust God. Now let's talk about his mercy, his mercy. Now God is a very merciful God, and when you look at his mercy, it is extremely, an extreme blessing. So we see the balance right here, just, justice, and what? So we see that with his punishment. And then what? With mercy. See, he is forgiving. He is full of pardon. Great verses, exact phrase where it says, mercy endureth forever. Have you ever remember hearing that in your Bible reading, mercy endureth forever? That phrase is repeated all over. Some examples include 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34 and verse 41. Ezra chapter 3 and verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 11. Luke chapter 18, verse 13 through 14. Not only that, this is important to understand. God, he does not want to punish the wicked. Didn't you know that? His goal is not to punish them. He has to, though. That's part of his attribute. Otherwise, he's an unjust God. But what he prefers is mercy, not judgment, actually. He wants to prefer, he prefers not to punish them, but to forgive them. Micah chapter 7, verse 18 through 19. Micah chapter 7, verse 18 through 19 says, God does not want to punish the wicked, but rather pardon them. See, that shows balance again. You see that so far? Positive, positive, negative. Positive, negative. See that? And it's going to be 100%. Now, you know what's really funny about some people? Some people, they said, oh, you make salvation too simple, says the Catholics. You make the sinners get away with their sins. Muslims will say that, oh, you know, there has to be good works involved to help out with God. You just make his forgiveness too great. Now, isn't this funny? When we talked about eternal punishment for their sins, they cry out their hands and say, that, that's not fair. Then when you talk about forgiveness, then they lift up their hands and they cry out, that's not fair. You know what they want? They want, it doesn't matter. You talk about mercy, they won't agree with you. You talk about justice, they won't agree with you. You know why? People want their own kind of God. They want a perverted, imbalanced, unfair, imperfect type of God. That's their problem. That's why this teaching is so important. You see that? It will be very helpful in all of your arguments on apologetics concerning all kinds of religions. What kind of a mercy is God's mercy if he requires you to live a just holy life where you clean up all your sins and live perfectly isn't it more 100 percent pure forgiveness pure mercy where he just wipes it all slate clean that's a more perfect god right there okay let's talk about his holiness now now this attribute is the most important attribute of god that's something that you have to put an asterisk on it's his holiness Calvinists like to say sovereignty, sovereignty, but it's not his sovereignty. It's his holiness. That is the number one important attribute of God. Such verses will include Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, 
Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3 and Exodus chapter 15 verse 11. In fact, if you look at Romans chapter 3 verse 23, the verse shows that His holiness separates us from Him. So that explains why God will damn a person in hell forever, why your good grandma who done so many good things cannot go to heaven. You know why? His holiness. His holiness. So there you see a negative part, but you see a positive part with His compassion. So His standards are lowered here. His standards are high, raised here, but His standards are lowered here with compassion. You see that once more? Balanced, negative, positive, once more. With His compassion, what does He do? Well, actually, I slipped up a little bit right here, so I'm going to jump to wrath, then I'll go back to compassion, okay? So wrath, here's another negative attribute of God, His wrath. His wrath, so we'll discuss that, then we'll come back to compassion. God is a God full of wrath. This is also called consuming fire as well. It's also called consuming fire in the Bible. Now, the verses to prove that God, our God is a consuming fire, not full of love, 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 and share, 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 like the world wants you to picture. Look at these verses, Deuteronomy 4, verse 24. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 3, Hebrews chapter 12, and verse 29. Those verses literally say our God is a consuming fire. Now, you think you want to take your chances with God after that. So it shows his wrath. See that? His extreme wrath and hatred. As a matter of fact, wrath can refer to literal and even metaphorical fire. So, wrath will cover all bases with fire, symbolically and even literally. The verses to prove it are Revelation chapter 14, verse 10, and John chapter 3, verse 36. Those prove the literal side. And then for the metaphorical side, it will be Psalms chapter 89, verse 46, as well as Ezekiel chapter 38, and verse 19. Now, is that a sin? Is wrath a sin? Depends on the context of the situation. You gotta understand this, wrath and anger is not a sin. Because Ephesians 4.26 and Matthew 5.22, Ephesians 4.26 and Matthew 5.22, those two verses are extremely important because people are going to condemn you that, oh, you Christians shouldn't be angry, shouldn't be angry, angry, anger is a sin. But no, the Bible says that be angry and sin not. See, anger is not considered to be a sin. But the verse continues, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And Matthew 5 verse 22 says, don't be angry without a cause. So those verses show that anger is a sin when it turns into like a strong and long grudge. Then that becomes a mental problem. You see that? And then the verse says, if you're angry without good reason, then that's a problem. But anger can come in very good causes. Like Jesus, he threw out the money changers out of the temple in great anger, the Bible says. Now, what can appease wrath, though? This guy. And then it becomes balanced. So that's why his, he has positive attributes that would make up the negative and then the negative attributes to make up the positive. So compassion can cover this one as well as wrath. So what appeases wrath is compassion because Psalms chapter 78 verse 38, it says that when God has wrath, what appeases his wrath is his compassion. So here's something that you can use in your daily walk in life if you understand God's nature. When God has wrath upon you, the best thing to do is to claim His compassion then. In prayer, claim His attribute of compassion that can appease the wrath. See, this teaching is extremely important because not only it covers apologetics, but it also covers your daily devotional life. It's very helpful. Micah chapter 7 verse 19 also shows his side of compassion. Then there are more verses that shows his compassion. Matthew chapter 18 
verse 25 through 33. That passage is rich in compassion. Having compassion on the servant, he let him go. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 23 shows how great God's compassion is. Now, here's something that makes sense. Why is it that we can be saved from God's wrath in hell? Because of the blood of Jesus. That blood of Jesus, so if I were to have a red pen, I'd draw it in red, but that blood of Jesus draws the line and appeases his wrath. It makes us close to God. Wrath separates us from God. Holiness separates from God. But his attribute of compassion brings us close to God. And that compassion cannot operate unless you have that blood. That's why he died on the cross. It is his act of that blood that silenced the holiness and wrath upon us and placed it upon Jesus Christ instead. And we received Christ's holiness instead. And Christ took our wrath. See how these attributes all come out perfectly. Your God is a brilliant God. That sacrifice at Calvary did, made all the difference in the world, you must understand. Now, the blood makes us close to God. The verses to prove it is Hebrews 9.22, Isaiah 53.5, and Ephesians 2, verse 13. Okay, now, our God is also a jealous God. What? Really? Yeah, he's jealous. Our God is a jealous God. As a matter of fact, didn't you know that his name is also known to be Jealous? If you looked at the book of Exodus, his name is Jealous at Exodus chapter 20. I don't know which verse, but it should be the first five or first ten verses. God says that his name is Jealous. So that even overruns the Jehovah Witnesses who says, Oh, God's name is only Jehovah, only Jehovah. Well, in the book of Exodus where he said his name's Jehovah, it also says in the book of Exodus, my name is Jealous. What are you going to do about that? Okay, other verses that show jealousy is not considered to be a sin is Joshua 24, verse 1, and Nahum chapter 1, verse 2. As a matter of fact, this is a powerful verse. If you write down 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, the verse says literally godly jealousy. So jealousy can be godly. For example, is it, is it right for you to be jealous if your wife is cheating on you, if your husband is cheating on you? Absolutely. You have an absolute right to be jealous. So jealousy is not bad considered in the context of the situation, just like his anger and wrath. You see how people are? They think that this is bad. They think this is bad. They think this is bad. We have a twisted world. You want, you know what kind of world they're trying to promote? Love, 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 love. What a sick world, imbalanced world, right? That's why it makes sense. There are a lot of people mentally ill somewhere in the head. And you, when you try to show them Bible, they're like, I don't get it. I don't get it. And they listen to their professors in school like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. See, mentally ill people. You know why? Because they have a wrong attributes in their personal everyday life. If you had these kind of attributes in everyday life, then a lot of things would click in your mind about God and your life would change. All right, another thing is his long suffering, long suffering. He can be jealous, but he can put up with you. So thus, positive and negative once more, his long suffering. Suffer long, see that? That's the idea, putting up with something long, long suffering. Verses to show his long suffering, which is immense. Numbers chapter 14, verse 18. Numbers 14, verse 18. Micah chapter 7, verse 18. And 2 Peter 3 9 is a wonderful verse on his long suffering. A wonderful verse. Because it says, The Lord is not willing that any, uh, excuse me, uh, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So in his jealousy, he can get angry at you for following after other gods, after the devil, after sin, rather than him. So he will damn you to hell, but he's also long-suffering. He will put up with you, and he's given you chance after chance. How many years have you lived 
How many times has God been gracious to you when you've taken his name in vain and you just uh, promoted your life in sin and he put up with you? See? What a great God you serve. Another thing is his righteousness. His righteousness. That's his other attribute is his righteousness. Our God is righteous. That's found at Psalms 116 verse 5 and Ezra chapter 9 and verse 15. Now, the problem with mankind, though, is that they don't want this attribute of God upon them. They want their own righteousness. Now, if you compare your righteousness with God's righteousness, yours is like 50% or 80% at best, if you're very honest, and I don't think anyone's at 80%, but God's 100%. Now, which attribute would you prefer so that you can go to heaven? <laughs> Romans chapter 10, verse 3 through 4. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. Those two verses are very rich that man's righteousness is definitely pale. All your righteousness are literally filthy rags, Isaiah 64 says. So that's powerful. God is righteous in what he does even when things look bad. That's another important note to know about God's attribute. If you know that God is righteous in everything he does, you wouldn't complain about how God does things in everyday life if you believe in that attribute of his. Those verses are found in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1, Psalms chapter 145, verse 17. When things look bad, you've got to remember this. God is righteous in what he does. God is always righteous. If something bad happens to your family, you know what you should do? God is righteous. Not why God, you've got to go say God is righteous. That's what you've got to do. All right, faithful. Our God is faithful. That's another attribute of his. Our God is faithful. Those will be found in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Psalms chapter 36, verse 5. Uh, God is a faithful God. Now, how great is his faithfulness? Why, my friend, when you got saved, you got the faithful promises of God. That's found at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. How great are his promises? Oh my goodness. There are so many that I can list out. But I'm going to give only three, and I think these three are good enough. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is faithful not to give you a temptation more than you can bear. 1 John 1, 7 through 9. He is faithful to forgive every time you confess and repent under the blood. Oh, I feel so guilty confessing. No, God is faithful to forgive. Wow. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. God is faithful in that he will make all things new and you're going to forget any pain you experienced right now or in your past. His faithfulness up in heaven will far outweigh and make up everything that you went through in your daily life. The Bible calls this exceeding great and precious promises. That's how great it is. The verse that shows this is 2 Peter 1.4. 2 Peter 1.4. That's how you describe how he is faithful to you. What a great, mighty God you serve. That's why this teaching is so important. You can understand better in defending your faith as well as everyday life that you go through. Now, another thing is about God is that he is known to be upright as well. Upright. Our God is upright. Well, let's go more at the top here so that we can make some more space. God is upright. Upright, it means fair and righteous. Fair and righteous together. So almost similar with just justice and uh, righteousness, but this one's a little bit more. The verse to prove it is Psalms chapter 25, verse 8. Now, here's the thing, is that God has the right to teach sinners since he is upright. And that becomes a powerful argument against relativism, moral relativism. Because is any man upright? No, but God is. So who are you to draw the line on morals and tell God that's unfair, this is what you should be doing? No, God has the right to teach you on how to do things. If he says homosexuality is wrong, you don't have the right to question him. So that's found in Psalms chapter 25, verse 8. Psalms 25, verse 8. Another thing is that in Psalms chapter 119, verse 137, his judgments are upright no matter what men may think. And that's what we covered in the intro. Men cannot understand God. See, why? Because his nature, his attribute is so pure, 100%, so much high, 
and you're so low, you'll never comprehend it. Another thing is Psalms chapter 92, verse 15. God cannot cast off his uprightness. Why? Because he's righteous. So don't consider that God has to be all lovey-dovey and compassionate. See? His uprightness, negative side, cannot be eliminated because just because of his positive sides that you would try to stress on his compassion and love. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 8. God is so concerned with his perfect, remember, perfect, 100%, uprightness that he does not like a wicked person so that would explain why he doesn't hesitate to damn a wicked person in hell forever in fact he doesn't like to hear a wicked person praying to him it's considered to be abomination now that doesn't mean that God does not listen to the prayers of lost people sometimes he will out of his great because of his mercy compassion he'll never uh, he'll never make this zero you see that However, what you got to understand is that you can't ignore his uprightness either. He's got to be balanced. So because of his uprightness, he doesn't like to hear wicked people praying. Another thing is his grace. Now, I love this attribute as well, his grace. His attribute of grace. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. God decreed that he is gracious. That's how powerful his attribute of grace is, is that he would decree it that he would be gracious and his decrees cannot be broken. Second Samuel chapter 12 verse 21 through 22. The Bible says that although David had to be punished, David knew that God was so gracious that he could probably stop it. So David took chances to pray, Lord, would you because you're gracious, may you not let this punishment happen upon me. So that's what I do when I pray to the Lord is that if I deserve some punishment or you know I don't deserve anything good from God I would claim his attribute of grace so to understand this attribute can be very handy in your daily life another thing is 2nd Kings chapter 13 verse 23 2nd Chronicles chapter 30 verse 9 Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 17 Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 17 in these three passages it shows despite how many times Israel sinned God said that he was still gracious that's why his grace is truly greater than all of our sins, as the hymn would go. It makes more sense why they would mention that. Romans 5, verse 20. I keep quoting this verse when I pray to God. Romans 5, verse 20. No matter how many times you sin, God's grace is always bigger. Now, that should be encouraging. I mean, in fact, if you would just experience God's grace and taste it, then you would truly understand how delightful it is. And that... And that phrase is found at 1 Peter 2, verse 3. 1 Peter 2, verse 3. I would usually quote that to make people understand, oh, if you would only know and taste how God's grace is. Another attribute of his is his good. God is good. Good or goodness. God is good. So in this sense, what we can see is that in Psalms chapter 25, verse 8, Psalms chapter 119, verse 68, in those two passages, it gives one meaning of his good and goodness. So we're going to cover two meanings here. The first meaning is that to know what is good or bad in this world that sets no boundaries for sin, we have God as the explanation. So that is a powerful argument against moral relativism again. If you know that God is good, then we know what are the rules and the boundaries of what's wrong and what's right. Tell an atheist if he has the right to lay the rules for that. He doesn't, because why? He's not good, 100%. But God is 100% good, thus he has the right to set the boundaries on what's considered to be wrong and what's considered to be right. A second meaning of his good and goodness is found in Psalms chapter 100, verse 5. Psalms chapter 34, verse 8. In that sense... Of his good and goodness what it means is that God is so good that it can last for generations and that verse also mentions about oh if you can only understand by tasting his goodness so not only his grace can you only taste but also his good and goodness if you would only taste it and see how the Lord is good so God's goodness in these two meanings which is interesting shows the negative and positive side the negative side is 
how good he is so he sets the boundaries and the standards of what's right and wrong. The positive side is that he is so good that he will bless you more than you can ever imagine. So there are two meanings with his goodness that shows positive negative sides. True. Our God is true. That's another attribute of God. That God is true. John chapter 17 verse 3 shows that God is the only true God. No other gods. Romans chapter 3 verse 4 shows no matter who they are or how right they sound, these people, God is the only truth and they're not. Let God be true but every man a liar. Powerful verse I memorized. Revelation chapter 19 verse 11. God's name is actually true. So not just jealous, but true. That's his name. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 28. God is true by being good to you. And Psalms chapter 119 verse 160. God's words are true from the beginning. That's how powerful God's word is. If you don't believe in the true, perfect Bible, true word of God, then you have to make God's attribute imperfect as well. You don't believe a perfect Bible, then his attribute must be imperfect. Why? God's attribute is true, and he said his word is true. At his very nature and core, his word is on a par with his attribute. Now, another attribute of God is his greatness, his greatness. God is so great that, as a matter of fact, it's greater than Solomon's temple. That's how, God, how great our God is. You might say, what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, Solomon's temple, it is estimated to be more than $140 billion for Solomon's temple. But Solomon said that God's so great that it's worth more than his temple. That's how great your God is, man. Extremely great. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 22 sh shows that no God is greater than our God. Psalms chapter 86 and verse 10, Psalms chapter 139 and verse 17 shows that his creation as well as his thoughts are so great. And 1 Chronicles 16, 25, Psalms 48, verse 1, Psalms 96, verse 4, Psalms 145, verse 3 shows that because our God is so great, he deserves to be greatly praised. That's why we sing hymns. That's why we sing specials. Because he deserves it, his greatness. That's why in our red psalm book, what it's called, great hymns of faith. See, everything's connecting with this teaching. Also, another attribute of God is that your God is terrible. Wait, did I hear that right, preacher? That's right, he's terrible. Now, in your definition of terrible, it's not what you think. Terrible means great awe or fear. In fact, God's name is terrible. Psalms chapter 99, verse 3. So ask a person, didn't you know that God has a terrible name? And look how they would respond. That's true in the Bible. Psalms chapter 47 verse 2 shows the terrible, the terrible nature of God as well as Joel 2.11, Psalms 106 verse 22, Psalms chapter 66 and verse 3, as well as Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 5 and Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 32. In fact, it's okay to call God terrible. You know that? Nehemiah, when he prayed in those verses, he called God terrible. In fact, his terrible nature shows that he can pardon, if you look at Nehemiah. Because God is so terrible, he can actually pardon. How so? Because when you're in so much awe of him, and terribleness means awe, that's why it makes sense that uh, he, you would be in awe when he pardons you. When he pardons you. Okay, another thing is his infinity. Well, that's a no-brainer. That's definitely part of his nature and attribute. He is infinity. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God always existed. De Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27, God is eternal. John chapter 10, verse 28, as eternal, God can give eternal life. Thus, he has the right to do so. In fact, what's really interesting is that when you look at Genesis 1, 1, it mentions time, beginning, matter, earth, heavens, space, energy, God created. And it shows that God's eternity was before all those things. Revelation chapter 22, verse 13, God is literally beginning and end. Alpha and omega, the verse says. That's Greek for the English alphabet of A to Z. 
immortality. God is immortal. Let's see how much we can squeeze here. Our God is immortal as well. So he, he is not mortal. He cannot die. 1 Timothy 1, verse 17, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 through 16 is immortality. Revelation chapter 10, verse 6, God cannot die, but will live forever. 1 Peter 1, verse 23, God's words cannot die, but live forever. See, his words are a part of his nature and attribute. You deny a perfect book, perfect Bible, then you do disgrace to God, you understand. That's important to understand. Romans chapter 14, verse 9, is a powerful verse. Because if God cannot die, then didn't Jesus die? So Jesus must not be God. So what's the solution here? Here's the thing. Here's another important issue. God is, not only, uh, God is the God of the living, but he's also the God of the dead too. But there's a verse that says God is not the God of the dead, but a, the God of the living, right? At the four Gospels. But in the other passage, it shows that God is the God of the dead. There's a confusion here. No, because after Jesus resurrected, see that? He also became known as the God of the dead. But before that, he's not known as the God of the dead, but only the God of the living. See, that's why you have to believe in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost being one God. It reconciles a lot of confusion and contradictions. Your God is brilliant, man. Your God's brilliant. He's eternal because of one side, the Father's side, the Holy Spirit. But he died because of the Son's side, Jesus Christ, when he took flesh upon himself. Your God is also immutable. Immutable. Immutability means unchanging. Unchanging. Your God is unchanging. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. James chapter 1, verse 17. Now... This is a problem. This is very helpful, which you need to mark down. 1 Samuel 15, verse 29, and Numbers chapter 23, verse 19 says that God does not go back on his words. But you'll find out in Genesis 6, verse 6, that the Lord repented. He changed his mind. Wait a minute. I thought our God's immutable, but God can change his mind. Here's the idea. The idea is when you look at 1 Samuel 15 and Numbers 23, where it says God does not go back on his words, the context is showing what God decreed to man, what God puts his word, his oath upon. He does not change. But in everyday life, he has the right to change his mind. Is it a sin if I want to drink lemonade, but I change my mind to drink water? See that? Then God cannot be a person. He's a person, okay? He has a right to change his mind. But his immutability, he does not change his mind when he puts his oath to it. He puts his word, decree upon it. Because if he changes his mind on that, then he's not a very good God, you understand. See, it clicks right here. So it solves a contradiction what people will show you. In Romans chapter 11, verse 29, it says that God cannot repent of his gifts. But if you look at the context of verse 26 through 28, it's what he decreed to man in writing. So that will solve the contradiction of God changing his mind, him repenting. But then the Lord, he does not repent as well. So this is an important note you got to write down. Okay, invisibility. Invisibility. Our God is invisible. Well, that's a no-brainer. In fact, look up all the verse that talks about his invisibility. Cannot see. Talk about no man has seen God any time. Look up the word invisible. Now, here are the three main attributes of God. These are the powerhouses that you probably heard. His omni. The first thing is his omnipotence. Omnipotence. This probably will go outside the screen of the camera. But his omnipotence means, omni means all. So all powerful. When God wants something perfect, he's going to create it to be perfect. That's Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, verse 3 and 4. Job chapter 42, verse 2. Psalms chapter 33, verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27. Now, here's the thing, is that some people will say, well, if God is so all-powerful, then can he lie? As a matter of fact, the Bible says God cannot lie. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. God cannot be tempted with sin. God cannot sin. James chapter 1, 
verse 13. So those two verses show there are some things God cannot do. And you've heard this argument from atheists all the time. Can God create a rock that he cannot move? Well, if you say God is all-powerful, why can't he do this? Why can't he do that? Here's the thing that will solve this problem. So this is an important teaching right here. In his omnipotence, it has to be what? Remember, what's the teaching? Balance and attributes of God. If he goes by whatever he wants to do, all-powerful, that violates his other attributes. Well, can't God forgive people without sending them to hell forever? See, that violates his attribute. It's not that God is weak. It's because all attributes have to be in balanced form and 100% all of them. So it's not to say that God is 90% powerful. He is truly 100% powerful. But 100% power will not violate 100% hatred, 100% wrath, 100% just and justice. That's why this teaching is so important. It's very helpful. Another omni is his omnipresence. Omnipresence. Okay, let me wrap it up real quickly here. Omnipresence. This means that God is present everywhere, all present. <clears throat> Those are found in Psalms 139, verse 7 through 10, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 23, Matthew chapter 10, verse 30, Ephesians 1, 23, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. His last attribute, omniscience. Omniscience. All knowing. All knowing. God knows everything you think. Those are found at 1 Chronicles 28, 9, Psalms 94, 11. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, Job chapter 34, verse 22, Job 42, 2, Matthew 12, 36, Isaiah chapter 40, and verse 28. And then I think I addressed a little bit about the critics here concerning omniscience as well over here, that God knows everything. Okay, so I hope that this teaching has been very helpful concerning about the balance and attributes of God. So we looked at nearly everything of God's nature and attributes. You'll see God is grace, God is upright, God is good, God is long-suffering, God is faithful, God is holy. Now you know. <laughs> now you know. Now you know. Heavenly Father, dismiss us now with your blessing. I pray today's discipleship was a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, 
I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.